Let's bow our heads and invite the Lord. Loving Father in heaven, it is good to be in your house this morning. Lord, we're thankful that you've given us health and grace, that we're able to come into your house on this beautiful day that you have made, this Easter Friday, Lord, a day whom thou hast made, and we rejoice because we know the one who made it. Father, look down upon us with grace and favor. You know every heart that is here and every heart that is listening. You know our needs and you know our desires. And Lord, you know what is best for us. And we pray, Lord, that you would grant us that which is best for us. Lord, let your word satisfy. Let your word, Lord, accomplish what you have intended even from the beginning. Because you have said that your word will not come back void, but it will accomplish your will. And therefore, we pray, Lord, that on this day, your will would be done as the message of the cross is spread throughout this world. And Father, that many would take time. As I went through during the week deciding which one to preach on, looking through all four, I saw that it it really didn't matter. It really didn't matter because the message is the same. There's a few details here and there that differ, but the message of the cross cross is, is, is still very clear. So for this morning, I've chosen to read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27. Matthew 27, beginning to read at verse 17. Some chapters are longer, some are um, not as much, but um, we'll start at 17. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas, and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail, nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man, person, see ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him, and they put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put it on, put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear the cross. And they were come unto a place called Gogatha, that is to say, a place of a skull. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there and set over his head and his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, 
Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he saith, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth, and now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sebastinak. That Sebastiani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they had heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among which were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and, and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's children. And when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple and went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto him, Say unto the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last error should be worse than the first. Pilate saith unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. I've read to the end of the chapter. Let's praise the Lord with hymn 89, hymn 89.
Our Father, our God, on this beautiful morning, Lord, where we can reflect back what thou hast done 2,000 years ago, what has been recorded in the scriptures, what the historians know are true and accurate, that thou, our Father, hast sent thy only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be the perfect sacrifice for the sins of each individual person, for the entire world, for all that would claim and want to be washed in the blood, that we might have life eternal. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, for that great sacrifice, for being willing to go to the cross, for being willing to be crucified unjustly, without sin, for without purpose, other than you loved us so much. So, Lord, we ask you now that you might be able to reveal these truths to us once again, that we might be able to understand them, that we might be able to believe them, and that we might, it might change our lives because we've been here this morning and we've heard thy gospel message. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that not only you hung on the cross for all of mankind, but that you died and you rose again in three days. Victory over death, victory over sin, victory over everything that would hold you to this earth. We thank you, Lord, that you're now interceding on our behalf. You hear our prayers and you respond to them. You answer them in a timely manner, in a manner that's always right on time. So, Lord, as we lay our petitions before you for those that are sing sick among us, for our dear brother Fr Frank and our sister Vera, sister Janice and sister Joanne and many others, Lord, you know them all. You are the great physician since you've created us. We pray, Lord, that you provide healing and comfort and strength. For those that have lost loved ones, Lord, we pray that you would comfort and care for them too, as only thou canst. We pray for those that are ministering the gospel in faraway lands. We pray that you would care for them too, as they would be away from family and friends. We thank you, Lord, that you care for them too. And we pray for those that are being persecuted for your name's sake. Those that are sitting in prison or being beaten because of they've shared the gospel. And we just pray, Lord, that you'd continue to give them zeal and courage and that their faith would be strengthened because they know you personally. We thank you, Lord, now for all this. Now give us a quietness of heart and soul that we might be able to hear you speaking to us individually, personally, for thou hast a message for all that have come. And we pray it now all in Jesus' name. Amen. Loved ones, last Sunday, Brother Willie preached from Matthew 21, talking about Palm Sunday, the highest point probably of, in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. When he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, people spread their clothes along the way, uh, took palm branches to salute him and speaking and, 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 and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And Brother Willie said that what he had accomplished in three years, and I thought about that during the week, and I thought if he accomplished this much and had such a following in three years, imagine if he had three more years of ministry on this earth. If he had just three more years, what could have been done? Maybe they all could have been persuaded. But it wasn't to be. The timeline was set by God. 
that was the end of the time that was given him. All the words that God wanted him to speak had been spoken, except for those that he would utter on the cross. And they too are so touching and relevant. The people are very fickle. We can't say that all the people were like that, that would yell and and, and say Hosanna and praise him and then five days later say crucify him, crucify him. It wasn't all. There were many that believed. And when the question was put, who is this? Who is this that had this following? And they said, this is Jesus the prophet. It wasn't a question that they didn't know who he was. That, like, what made him so great? What made him so powerful? More powerful than the Pharisees. A greater following than anyone they had seen in a long time. And then it all changed. Then it all changed because the Pharisees knew they didn't have much time. They had to stop him now. And that they had a meeting, and it was decided that they will stop him now. When we survey the wondrous cross, as the hymn writer says, when I survey the wondrous cross, we see many things. I looked up the word survey because um, you think of the word survey is when you survey a piece of property or, 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 or something like that to get the exact measurements, and that is one of the meanings. But when I looked it up in the dictionary, it also says that it's also a close examination or to inspect for a purpose. And to inspect for a purpose is really what this is all about. To inspect what went on here what happened here, and the purpose behind it. And it's a perfect description, really, of of the crucifixion and of the hymn writer that said, when I survey this cross. And if we think about it, what we see today when we survey this cross, we have a different perspective than the people that were around him at that time. And there were many around him, his family, his mother, his disciples, his followers, and of course his accusers and those that wanted him to be crucified. They all had their different vantage point and their different thoughts of what happened. But nobody really knew the whole story that was there at that time. They would later, when the Holy Spirit came to the disciples later, and they realized and they knew all the things that Jesus had said and how they all fell into place of, and how it had to be. The cross had to be. There was no getting around it. There was no other way. The cross was a means of capital punishment, really. There's no other way to put it. Crucifixion was the way the Romans, they used it for their worst criminals to put them to death. Not everybody, but just the worst criminals. It was horrible when you think about it. All the different ways of capital punishment, it was worse than than the gas chamber or the guillotine or, or the firing squad. Those are instant, those are quick deaths. But the cross is painful, it's suffering. It's humiliating. It's a slow, excruciating death. It was really as the songwriter described it, the emblem of suffering and shame the emblem of suffering and shame, the old rugged cross.
when we survey this cross, we have to think of why, of why, and remember about what Christ suffered and why he suffered and that it really was about us. It was for no other reason. It was about us. We see and we hear many things when we survey the cross, as we read in, in the stillness his word, and we look at it and we ponder it, we hear the words of Christ as he hung in pain, as he suffered. And the words that he spoke, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. For they know not what they do. Did they know or didn't they know? We don't know for sure. But many did not. Many did not know. Because they refused to believe that he was the truth when he said that I am the truth, that I am the way. And they stopped their ears in many of the accounts we read. They refused to listen, even though they were pricked deep in their hearts convicted by the word, by the truth that came from heaven. And yet he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He spoke to his mother, spoke to the disciple, and he promised salvation to the thief on the cross on the one side of him. He promised salvation what a fulfillment of, of Jesus' own words when he said that ask and you shall receive. All this thief asked for was, Lord, remember me. And then when the other thief railed against him and said, get us off the cross if you're the son of God, he said, in repentance, we deserve to be here. We're guilty. And it was because of that, Jesus recognized that as repentance. And he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. And he also spoke to God. First he spoke to his father, and then he spoke to God. The only time in the Bible that he referred to his father as God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He wasn't his father at that moment. The sins of the world were hanging upon him, and God had to turn his back. Why hast thou forsaken me, he spoke even though he knew the reason why he came into this world. You can see through these words the pain, the abandonment, the physical pain that none of us could imagine. And then the end, it is finished. It is finished, but when we survey this cross, we know along with those words, there were three hours of darkness in the middle of the day. There was an earthquake, we read. All this at the same time that Jesus was hanging on the cross. One only wonders what the response in the hearts of the Pharisees were at that time. The response of those that screamed, crucify him, crucify him. The ones that said, release unto us Barabbas, a convicted killer, and crucify Jesus. What was going on in their heart when they saw this, when they surveyed the cross, and they saw the events unfolding? But we also remember when we survey the cross, 
that it should have been us. It should have been us on that cross. He died for our sins. And that really shows how terrible sin really is. To forgive these sins, it took that much. And what a horrible price he had to pay to set us free from it. There was no other way. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible tells us there is no remission for sins. We're fortunate to be able to see all these things in hindsight because we have the word in its fullness and the people at that time that stood around the cross, they didn't. They weren't so privileged, but yet one was. One was who wasn't there at the time, and that was John the Baptist. When he saw Jesus arising after his baptism, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He knew God had given him the insight that this was that perfect lamb, that sacrificial lamb that the people of Israel since almost the beginning of time had, had sacrificed and their sins were still there. There was a certain forgiveness, but all that sacrificial laws and ceremonial laws were all pointing to this one perfect sacrifice during Passover time in Jerusalem, and that is the, the Son of God, the Lamb of God that was sacrificed, which taketh away the sins of the world, as, as John the Baptist stated. Let's look at this from, from God's viewpoint. The cross. There was sin almost from the beginning. And because of God's holiness, he had to deal with it. He had to punish evil because of who he is, because of his holiness. But on the other hand, God is also love. God is also love. And he had a great desire to find a way to save mankind from this punishment, from this severe punishment. And he did it by offering his only son. There was no other way. In, in, in the heavens, we read in, in Hebrews, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. The patterns, it was necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens, of which we have no clue of really, except to know that in the heavens there is only purity and holiness. And sin in any form cannot enter there. It had to be paid for. And it was paid for by, with the blood, with that perfect lamb, with the blood of Jesus Christ. As we also read in Romans, we know that all God asks of us is, is to show repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ. And really, that's exactly what the thief, the repentant thief on the cross, was showing. He showed repentance towards God. 
and he had faith in Jesus Christ. He asked Jesus to remember him when he gets to heaven. Remember me, he said. And that's all God asks of anyone. Have faith in my son. Show faith in my son. And repentance towards me. Repentance over your sin. Repent over your sin. Acknowledge what you've done wrong, as the thief did. We're guilty, he said. We're thieves. We stole. They know we stole. We know we stole. We're guilty. But the blood of Christ can take it away again. We read in Romans, when we do these things, when we have faith in Jesus Christ and repent of our sins, therefore being justified by faith, that's how it works. We're then justified by faith, justified by believing in the Son of God and have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We're justified before God. In other words, we're declared right before God. And we escape the judgment. As it says, we shall be saved from wrath through him, through Jesus. The wrath that God first spoke about in, in Exodus, when they were yet coming out of Israel, out of Egypt, I should say. And the wrath of God was coming upon, the angel of death was coming that night to kill. And God said, and they shall take of the blood and strike it up, that is of a lamb they had killed. They should take the blood of the lamb and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorposts of their houses. And I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, and I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You will escape the judgment. You will escape the wrath, the anger of God. There's a hymn that speaks about that. And it's called the blood of the lamb. It speaks about what this blood can do and will do. Hymn 188 in our blue, in our red books. Christ our redeemer died on the cross. He died for the sinner, paid all his due. All who receive him need never fear for he will pass, he will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Yes, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Yes, when I see the blood of the Lamb, I will pass over you. Chiefest of sinners, Jesus can save. As he has promised, so will he do. O sinner, hear him, trust in his word. Then he will pass, he will pass over you. Judgment is coming. All will be there who have rejected or have refused, O sinner, hasten, let Jesus in, then God will pass, will pass over you. O what compassion, O boundless love, Jesus hath power, Jesus is true. All who believe are safe from the storm. O he will pass, he will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Yes, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Yes. When I see the blood of the Lamb, I will pass over you. The people at that time in 
Egypt didn't know that this would, and this was all pointing to that perfect sacrifice, to the atoning blood, the only blood that can really give atonement. I know I've quoted this before, as it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And in the 1980s, I recall, uh, Time Magazine had a, a cover picture on it of a, because they did an interview with the North Vietnamese general. And the, the headline on the front cover was, Victory is Bought with the Price of Blood. I didn't read the article. I didn't need to. It said it all by the cover itself. Victory is bought with the price of blood. I'm sure, I don't know if this man was a Christian or not. He was a communist general in the North Vietnamese army. Chances are that he wasn't, but he probably didn't realize what he said, how, what that really meant in a much deeper way that victory is bought with the price of blood. He was talking about victory in war and the price of blood of soldiers. But how much more the blood of Jesus Christ that brings us victory, victory over death, victory over sin, and promises us endless life. We read in Colossians, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. When I look through some of these verses, verses like this in, in the New Testament, I couldn't believe really how, how many I came to. I couldn't read them all now. I didn't realize there were that many. It was really, and it really made me think that it really is everything about this Bible and everything about it is about the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that was shed for for mankind, for those that would claim it by faith. It all points to that. We can escape the judgment of God if we claim this by faith. If we claim it, it's not a long drawn out thing it usually is more involved than the words that were spoken by the thief on the cross, but it has the same connotation. It's really the same. Lift up your eyes to Jesus Christ, the only one that can declare us right before God. The only one that can and will confess us before the angels and before his Father in heaven. Yet, we're not perfect, no. But he will wrap us in his robe of righteousness. It's his robe of righteousness that gets us to heaven, not ours. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is but as filthy rags before him but he will wrap us in that robe, unspotted, unspotted, and we gain entrance, undeserving, undeserving not by what we have done, but what Jesus has done on the cross for us. Amen.
the number? 491 out of the gospel hymn. O blessed Lamb of Calvary, our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for this day and that so many years ago, probably about 3,000 years ago, it was you saw it needful to be obedient to, to death. Um, you obeyed your Father's will and you were obedient. Father, thank you for going to the cross for each and every for this world, for, for our sins, for dying for us, Father, for making, and, and, and Father, help us 
not to take it for granted, but to be thankful for it, for it is a gift. And it was bought by a great price, a price that none of us could pay. And you were the only way. But we're thankful for that, Father. We're thankful that in the garden you prayed not your will, but your Father's will be done. And you even sweat drops of blood, Father. Help us in those things that you call us to do, and that you call us to, to be faithful and to be obedient, to do, to do your Father's will. And, 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 to, and, and Father, you even went for, because of the joy that was set before you. You, in, you despised the shame. You endured the cross. Help us also for the joy that will be set before us. We have heaven. We have so much to look forward to if we've given our lives, our, our hearts to you, our souls to you, and help those who are unconverted. We pray that, thank you for the message that we heard today. Bless Brother Fred for his uh, message this morning, Father. Give him a double portion of your spirit and your blessing. And, and thank you for speaking to each one of us. And we just pray for the unconverted, Father, that, and those who are seeking you, that you'd, and you gave us power. Thank you that you gave us power to become your sons and your daughters, to become your children. You didn't stay in the grave, and we're going to learn about that on Sunday if it is your will, if you will tarry, Father. But, and help us also to um, those who are, who are unconverted, who are seeking you, to continue to seek you. For you said if they seek you, they will find you. And... If they knock, well, Father, and we're just thankful that you have opened the door for each one of us, and you have made the way, and you will make the way for them. And we're encouraged by that, Father. And to those who, who aren't with us in, in our midst this day, Father, who we just pray that you would call them with your still small voice. And while it is called today, that they would harden not their hearts, but that they'd soften their hearts, and that they would... Um, give their lives to you, Father, that you would soften their hearts and that they'd give their heart and their lives to you. And, and Father, and be baptized even as you were and you fulfilled all righteousness in doing that. And none of us are without an excuse. And, and so we just want to thank you that that offer, that gift was offered today. That message went forth. Um, you even offered it to those two you offered it to those two thieves on the cross, Father. And so you offer it to us today. And, and you did die for us. And we're thankful for that. And help us not to take it for granted. And, but, and Father, not just that Easter time, help us not to remember this, but each day um, we, we should think about it and, and be mindful. And, and in our goings and our, in whatever we wherever we are, that we would remember that you did die for us and that you, paid a, you bought us with a great price and not to take it for granted. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of your love, for coming into this, for your son who died for each one of us and for coming into this world and seeing it needful. You were the only way that we could have salvation and, and you paid it for us and we're thankful for that. Um, we commit the rest of this day into your care and keeping. And, and Father, we also want to just say that we're thankful that it, you didn't stay there. You rose from the dead. And on that third day, there was an earthquake. And the tomb was empty. And we can have power, as we heard this morning, that we can have power over death and hell and, and over the grave and hell, mostly hell. And Father, that's where we all would have been going if you if you wouldn't have died for us. But and not just us, but for the whole for, for those for our our children and our children's children and for our grandchildren, for our brothers and our sisters, our friends and our family. You died for each one of us. And we pray for them, those who don't know you, that they come and and we pray earnestly for them that they come back to you, Father. And that they'd and, and you have given them that power, the power to overcome this world. And you sent, and it was expedient that you'd go to the Father. And I think we might learn about that on Sunday, if it is your will, because you sent the Comforter, you sent the Holy Spirit, and you had to go to the Father for that reason. 
and we're thankful for that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would the brother suggest a closing hymn? Of the gospel hymns, hymn number 74.
We have time now for an exchange of readings, if there would be any. Thank you for visiting us today, and please extend our greetings to your parents and to the Brethren in Western Road, Toronto. Thank you. I spoke with Brother Paul Lupsor from Rodney, and he extends greetings, and Nancy also sent greetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from Sister Erica. Uh, just a reminder that the schedule is a little different for Sunday. Uh, we'll have our morning devotions at 8 o'clock, and then Bible class at 9.30, and morning service at 10.30, and there'll be no lunch and no afternoon service. So a little bit modified schedule for Sunday, uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Um, as I sat and I listened to this morning's service, um, it became very evident that what happened 2,000 years ago um, on Mount Calvary was the turning point for all of history. A decision point not only for people and nations, but individuals. This was the opportunity that had God had given mankind to be personally reconciled with him. He's always made a wanting to make a personal relationship with, uh, with people from the Garden of Eden. But this was the master plan that was put in place where he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die, to shed his blood, and to have an opportunity to us. As the veil was rent from top to bottom, it allowed us now to enter into the Holy Holies to make a personal relationship with Almighty God. And this is the opportunity now to make right with God so that eternity can be lived with God. So let's take this time to consider, for those that have already made that covenant relationship, to recognize what it took to make that with Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. But for those that haven't yet, that today is the moment. Today is the time to put all things aside and to claim Jesus and his shed blood and the victory that he had over it that we can have too if we put our full faith in him. This will conclude this uh, Good Friday service. May God be with you till we meet again.